Hello everyone and welcome back to our reading of Great Mysteries, Opposing Viewpoints, Vampires. And today we ask the question, how did Christianity influence the belief in vampires? Let's find out. In Western and Eastern Europe, belief in vampires was greatly influenced by Christianity. The Catholic Church was especially powerful, and its tenets were strictly adhered to by many people throughout Europe. One idea supported by the Church was that vampires existed and that they were agents of the devil. The Church officially recognized the existence of vampires in 1215, during the Fourth Lateran Council of Catholic Church leaders in Rome. The Church also established itself as the only authority strong enough to eliminate vampires. By recognizing vampires as well as maintaining that church leaders must be present to eliminate them, the church endorsed and reinforced folk beliefs about vampires. Today it might seem strange that people believed so strongly in vampires and the devil. But in the world of early Christianity, and in all the centuries of the Middle Ages, almost everyone believed in Satan and his demons and vampires. A story from History of England by William of Newburgh shows the involvement of the Church in exterminating vampires. Modern scholars consider William of Newburgh to be a reliable source of facts, so it is interesting that the following vampire account is included in his history. According to Newburgh, a certain man died in Buckinghamshire and was buried on the eve of the Ascension in 1196. The following night, he suddenly entered his wife's bedroom, causing her the greatest alarm and nearly killing her by leaping upon her with all his weight. He did the same the next night. On the third night, she lay awake, along with a company of people to watch with her. He still came, but was driven away by the crowd. On subsequent nights, he did the same to his own brothers in the same town. The archdeacon then wrote to the Bishop of Lincoln to ask his advice in combating so intolerable an evil. The bishop consulted with theologians and learned that similar occurrences had often taken place in England. All agreed that there would be no peace in Buckinghamshire until the body of this poor man was burned to ashes. The bishop was unwilling to take such drastic action. Instead, he wrote out in his own hand an absolution or pardon from all sins for this man who had died. The bishop ordered that, regardless of the reason, this man wandered from the grave. The archdeacon should open the tomb and lay the pardon upon the breast of the corpse. The body was found uncorrupted, as fresh and undecayed as it had been on the day of the funeral. After the tomb was resealed, the dead man never bothered anyone again. This tale reinforces the idea that only the power of the church could combat vampires. Another tale from this period shows that vampires feared the power of the church so much that objects considered holy could be used to immobilize them. Walter Mapp wrote a book called Anecdotes of the Royal Court in 1197. It included the story of a knight who had three children. On the morning after each birth, the baby's throat was found slit. Blood stained the cradle. The expected fourth delivery was accompanied by prayers and sacrifice. The house and the surrounding area were brightly lit so that nothing would escape the family's notice or vengeance. That very day, a stranger arrived. Tired from his long journey, 
and begged in the name of God to rest a bit in the castle. He offered to stay up and help watch for the unknown killer of the children. By midnight, the members of the household were mysteriously falling asleep. The stranger, however, remained awake, and saw the most trusted nurse bend over the cradle, about to slit the infant's throat. Fortunately, the stranger was able to grab her and rake the family. When the nurse would not speak, the stranger charged her with being a vampire who only looked like the real nurse. He pressed the key of the castle chap onto her face. The holy key branded her with its impression. The nurse vampire flew out of the window howling and screeching and never returned to the castle again. In this story, the key to the chapel, like the cross and other popular tales, scared the vampire away. In 1489, two Catholic priests, James Brenger and Henry Kramer, were assigned to write the Malleus Maleficarum, a handbook for use in the Inquisition Rich Trials. The Inquisition was an official court of the church that tried cases of heresy. A heretic was a person who promoted ideas or acted contrary to church teachings. Some of the activities discussed in the Malleus Maleficarum are related to vampirism. One tale included in the book relates the story of a certain town where many people were dying of a plague. A rumor circulated that the plague was being caused by a certain woman who had died and now was slowly eating her burial shroud. The villagers believed that the plague would not end until she had digested the whole shroud. A town council decided to dig up the body. They indeed found the shroud half eaten. Struck with horror, the mayor immediately cut off her head with his sword. The plague stopped. The Malleus is filled with similar accounts, all of them revealing how seriously the church regarded vampires. The Greek Orthodox Church provided another powerful connection between the church and vampirism. The Greek Orthodox tradition has always expected from its members complete obedience, conformity and attendance. Failure to follow these standards would put a member in danger of excommunication being expelled from the church. The church charged that if a sinner was excommunicated, he or she was more prone to vampirism. This was because excommunication supposedly stopped the body from decomposing after death and prevented the spirit from finding eternal rest in heaven. Favorite curses among the Greeks are, may the earth not receive him and may he remain incorrupt. Again, the power of the church is evident. Non-believers or sinners could be doomed to roam the earth as vampires for not following the church's teachings. Among the important students of vampires was the Greek scholar, physician, and theologian Leo Alatius. During his long career, he spent many years studying in the archives of the Vatican Library in Rome, and working as a missionary in Europe for various popes. He died in Rome in 1669. His study of vampires appeared in his book On the Current Opinions of Certain Greeks, published in 1649. Le Vicolacus is the body of an evil and wicked man, often one who has been excommunicated. Such bodies do not, like other corpses, decompose after burial, but having a very tough skin, become swollen and distended. The skin becomes stretched like the parchment of a drum. These bodies, Alatius continued, are controlled by the devil and come out of their tombs at night. 
They knock on doors of houses, calling residents by name. Anyone who answers will die the next day. Since people know that the Vicolacus never calls the name twice, they always wait to hear it a second time. If people begin to die without explanation, graves of the recently dead are opened. If a body is found uncorrupted, the priests are summoned to perform services, and it is burned on a pile of dry wood. Alatius firmly believed in vampires. He wrote, It is stupid not to admit that such bodies are frequently found incorrupt in their graves. God may, indeed, permit the devil to do his worst. The church often encouraged these beliefs in order to entice people to obey and fear the church. In addition, among peasants who could neither read nor write, the church was the primary source of information about the world. The belief in vampires flourished alongside the belief in Christianity, but other reasons also reinforced the acceptance of vampires. In order to understand these, it is important to examine the way of life in the Middle Ages. Uh, yes, well, that would be all for today. Very fascinating, isn't it? Anyway, I'll see you on Saturday. See ya!